All right, well, you probably knew this was coming. We did the special design tier list, we did the sub weapon design tier list, and now it's time for the main weapon design tier list. When I tell you that your main weapon is poorly designed, make sure to, to go and, and, and libel me in the YouTube comments. It'll be great. I'm going to start this one from the top as well. I'm going to start with very cool please keep. These are all of the weapons that I'm like... Just the main weapon itself is really fun, and I like it a lot. Um, so we're going to start with the Splash. The Splash is really cool because it has not really needed to be touched that much. It has not changed very much as a main weapon. And it has still been reliably pretty strong through most of its existence. There has been a time, of course, where its special was overtuned, but the main weapon itself is only really strong for that because it paints really well. Um, this is a weapon that paints like crazy and has perfect sh accuracy even while jumping, which is crazy, but it still feels balanced because it has such short range and not the best time to kill. And I really like that because it feels really powerful in some respects while still being totally balanced. Like... This thing, you can move and groove with it, and it feels just so nice to have all the shots go where you want them to go, to always have the paint where you need it and be able to scoot all the way around to have that lightweight movement speed. Like, there's a, a huge skill ceiling with this thing just because of how maneuverable it is and what you can do with all of the aim. But again, it's not overpowered. It's not something that, as a main weapon, can just bully you out of your position because of those factors we talked about before. So I think this is super well designed. There are a lot of kits that work really well on this thing. And it's super versatile, which makes it a lot of fun, I think, that you can express yourself on this weapon. You can play it in different ways, and those different ways will work. Um, it makes it so that different kits really change how it functions in a big way. So a lot of fun. Really like the Splash. Also really, really like the Slosher. Uh, this is I, one of the coolest hitboxes in the game. Like, the fact that you can curve your bullets by just whipping the controller and it kind of works the way you kind of expect it to. You're almost like whipping the bucket yourself, IRL, with your controller and your inkling is like mimicking that motion. I think that's sick. I also think it's sick that you can use that to make the hitbox wider on a weapon that would otherwise be really precise. Um, and that... It, it, it feels cool doing it, and it's not, like, super easy, but it is also something that makes the weapon a lot more powerful. Um, I like the range on it. It's a perfect kind of mix of short range and mid range where you can go up there and be aggressive, but you are able to keep something at arm's length, which is great with a weapon that has such a high commitment to its shots. Um, it it kind of feels like, to make a melee comparison, it feels like the character of Marth, who's got just a little bit more range, but also a little bit slower of a frame data, and you kind of zone people out um, without actually having... Um, but Marth doesn't have a projectile, which means he's not quite as long range, even though his melee range is very long. Um, here, obviously, you know, every weapon is ranged, but you kind of get where I'm coming from, where it's uh, fun to like play to keep people in that butter zone. Um, so I really enjoy this weapon, and maybe that has something to do with me liking Melee Marth. But uh, I think there are a lot of other people who agree with me on that. Speaking of keeping people at like arm's length, Bamboo, um, I this is the weapon that took me the longest to warm up to in Splatoon 2. Um, at first, it just felt really unsatisfying to like land a very difficult charger shot and then it just doesn't splat them. Um, MPU almost fixed that and almost broke the weapon in the process, but now that that is not in the game anymore um, and that I'm better at the game, I think it's a lot of fun. It's fun having a charger where missing one shot doesn't waste like three seconds of your time that you get to just kind of try again. And so the times that you hit sick charger shots, even if you don't actually splat the player, still feel good because you get more opportunities to try. 
Um, I think that part's nice. The fact that it's a little bit more on the aggressive side and has to, you know, play a little bit further forward, um, I think makes it kind of fun that there's a little bit more risk to playing it. Um, so I'm a big fan of the bamboo. Dreadringer, I like the... It's, it's basically, you know, just the vanilla slosher, but now there's two of them. Um, and the, the fact that, like, you have to aim both of those separately is cool for, I think, a lot of the same reasons that you, aiming each individual part of the slosher hitbox. I think there are, like, 11 little dots of ink that go out, and you have to line one of them up with the opponent. It, it feels kind of similar with the Dreadringer. Um, and Dreadringer is a nice kind of slightly more range sort of way to look at the class, but, you know, slightly longer amount of time that it takes to fire. I think they get a better kit on this thing, and we're going to have a lot of fun with it. It's just it didn't get lucky on the uh, Splatoon 3 lottery. Nautilus is sick. Nautilus is so sick. Oh my goodness, Nautilus is sick. Like, the charge management aspect of it, it you're already doing so much thinking and so much planning but also it's aggressive and it's going to go in there and it's going to beam people and being able to beam people with this thing makes you sick. This weapon's sick. Like it takes a, a class that's normally very immobile and is difficult to make into an aggressive weapon and just says, okay, well this weapon needs mobility to be able to be aggressive. So let's give it mobility without taking away the charge mechanic that makes a splatling a splatling. And you've got this really cool, one-of-a-kind, mid-range, like, bully that gets rid of the enemy front line, but also has to be a little bit careful about how it dives in. It can't go in quite as quickly as, say, a shooter could. And so it has to be a little careful. It has to dance right around the danger zone all the time, constantly like getting charge. But then it has so much, you know, of a skill ceiling, so much potential to show off how sick your aim is when you do get into that chance to actually splat someone. So huge fan of the Nautilus. Uh, Dually Squelchers, I don't know if Jump Tech was intentional. I imagine it probably wasn't, but it's sick. And if they get rid of it, I'm going to be incredibly sad. Um, this is a weapon that hasn't seen a lot of love in this game just because of the way the maps are designed. They don't really play to the, the strength of jump tech being able to kite people. Um, but this is such a, a mechanically intensive, interesting weapon. Like, the weapon doesn't give you a lot with its firepower, and you have to make up for that with your movement. But it gives you insane movement. So it's a really cool balance of strengths and weaknesses that, again, allow for a lot of skill expression. That's going to be a pretty common factor across all of these weapons at the top of the list. Um, the more skill expression they have, the cooler I think they are. Um, speaking of which, we have the Tetradulis. This is a weapon that demands really, really intensive aim skills because you can shoot while you're rolling, not just in, be you know, in between the dodge rolls. And... Being able to do that means that if you can aim, you can splat people faster. And the faster you can aim, the faster you can splat people. And you have to be constantly accounting for what angle your opponent is moving at, when it's time to go all in, and what mo angle you're moving. So you have to adjust your aim while you're moving there. It takes a lot of practice. And it's also just so aggressive and so much fun to just dive in over and over again and just play more and more of the game in that state where it's a 1v1, where it's you and your aim, your movement and your aim versus their movement and their aim, and who's going to come out on top. Like, you spend more of the time playing an exciting version of Splatoon. Um, not to mention the fact that you're going to be running quick response, you get back to that exciting moment even sooner. So, a lot of fun there. Um, the Dowser Dooleys, this is very new, and my opinion of it may change, uh, especially if it gets, like, another kit and ends up being really boring and oppressive or something like that but i think it's like very unique and what it does is different from a lot of other weapons um it's kind of like an inverse squeezer i guess in that the long range shots are the ones that don't do as much damage or as consistently whereas the short range shots are the ones that do a lot i feel like that's probably the way that the squeezer should have been designed in the first place thinking about it but here we are um 
this is um, really, really long range, and you can play it from pretty far away, and it feels pretty comfy playing it there. It's, it's kind of like how a lot of people start off playing the Dually Squelchers, where they're just kind of walking around and shooting from pretty long range. Um, but unlike the Dually Squelchers, now you can dodge roll in and hard commit to a fight and, like, play the, the fast version of Duallys, which is a lot of fun. Dually Squelchers get a lot of their, like, fast, exciting skill expression kind of play from the ability to kite back. But these weapons can just kind of go in and take someone out if they want to. Um, so, again, a lot of fun. I think Duallys as a class are very fun. The idea of dodge rolling is just really compelling on just an emotional level. Um, they allow you to feel cool. I think that uh, you'll, you'll see, I talk about the shorter range duallys further down that I think they could use a little bit of adjusting, but I think these ones, because they bring something unique to the mechanic of duallys, every, every single one of them has some quirk to them that makes them play radically differently, and it's not just like a, a range hitbox kind of thing, damage kind of thing. Um, I, I think that all of those are really neat, and I l I'd like to have all of them back. Uh, tent is... I think the, the really cool Brella to me, um, it's the one that lets you do things while the shield is functional. Um, the, the undercover Brella, I mean, it does, its shield isn't that functional. Um, the V Brella, you have to choose between shielding and shooting and everything feels really slow and it feels kind of clunky in the middle, but the tent makes up for that a little bit because it's slow as heck it really is but it has the ability to one shot so you don't have to worry as much about hitting multiple shots it also protects you more and protects you for longer to allow you to set up to be able to play so while it's going to be slow once you actually get in there you're going to have a big impact and everyone's going to have to pay attention to you um the, the solo play potential on this thing is huge. The mind game of what side of the shield are, they are on is really, really fun. Um, there's a lot of counterplay to it, but it still feels powerful despite all of that counterplay being there. So, yeah, I, I'm a, a big fan of this. Like, watching a really skilled tent player go is really interesting and really fun. So, happy that that's in the game. Range Blaster is, is probably my favorite blaster design. This is, I feel like, how most blasters should just kind of feel. Like, it's definitely got a lot of downsides in terms of its mobility, which makes it very vulnerable. Its shot velocity, or not shot velocity, fire rate is really, really slow. So you're very committed every time you go in for anything. But the AoE hitbox means that if you get hit once, you're either getting out of range or you're down. And the one shot is so fast that it's a real glass cannon in a game that everyone is a glass cannon. <laughs> Everybody only has 100 HP. It doesn't matter, you know, there are no tanks here. There are no healers here. Um, the tent is the closest they come, but it's not even the player that's tanking. It's the tent umbrella. So they can still go down in an instant. But... This weapon somehow manages to feel even more high risk, high reward. Um, and that's a lot of fun to me. Stamper feels really fluid. It feels like you can play it in so many different ways. And those ways just transition from one to the next in a really fun way. Like you can be poking at someone from long range. You can be trying to do DPS from mid range. You can be going for melee hits. And you kind of just move between from one to the other really smoothly in a way that uh, it tests your decision making like when do you want to be doing what um, it tests your knowledge of the weapon to find the combo you're looking for to pair up with your teammates to you know get those combos and it's not like super aim intensive but it still feels satisfying to hit that vertical slash because it takes so long to get there and the, with the shot velocity it's really slow and dodgeable. So whenever you do manage to make it land, it's like, oh yeah, that feels good. Um, and it does, does still have its weaknesses. You know, you get on top of this at a certain range and it definitely goes down very quickly. Um, it doesn't have the fastest DPS unless it's able to hit his, its combo. And even that's not the fastest thing. So, um, but the fact that it has so much object damage makes it really valuable. Um, 
and I, I like that uh, even though it's a weapon that has this slower fire rate, it doesn't feel like some other weapons do, where it's really hard to like get through a, a, a splash wall or the Rainmaker shield or something. Um, some weapons just feel like, oh, well, I can't do something now because my weapon doesn't do that. Um, they made sure not to give this weapon that disadvantage, and I appreciate that about it. Next up, these weapons are, they're, they're nothing I'm like super over the moon about, but I have like no qualms with them being in the game. Like, I think they're a great addition to Splatoon. It's just like, there's nothing that makes me want to give this an A+. This is like an A, A-, minus. you're doing fine. Um, you know, keep up the good work, but also this was nothing like, th this wasn't a stroke of brilliance, per se, that they came up with this particular thing. Junior is a super great design to give new players because it's going to paint a lot even if they've got stiff stick controls and all they're doing is walking straight forward in a line. Um, you know, the, the shot spread is just good enough that they're still going to paint pretty well before they figure out how to optimize that. And it's pretty short range, so it forces them to learn mechanics about cover, but they've got a lot of mobility to work with. So they're not going to feel locked into place. Like, don't give a new player a heavyweight weapon right away because they're usually going to struggle a lot with that. It's going to feel frustrating. They're going to feel like they get stuck, they get caught. Um, this is definitely the way to start them off, to give them something that's going to paint a lot, even if they're not painting very optimally, and that's going to allow them to move out of danger if they notice it and reward them early on for taking evasive maneuvers. Um, it's definitely on the weak side in combat, and I think as people figure that out, then they start to gravitate towards other playstyles a lot of the time, um, up until the point where they discover the existence of the support class, and then, you know, depending on whether the junior happens to have a good special at the time, then they might come back to it. But um, giving it a splat bomb and giving it that short-range shooter mode, like, you can't complain too much if that's what you've got early on as you're trying to learn the game. Um, teaches you a lot of the basics, so I think it's great from that perspective. Um, if it weren't for its utility as, like, the first weapon in the game, I might even put it a, a slot lower in that it really needs to get a lot out of its special in order to feel particularly useful. Otherwise, it just feels very passive and very difficult to move forward with. Um, better than a few weapons on here, but it really gets bullied in current meta if all you're trying to use is the main weapon. You really need the combination of the, the bombs that it gets and some strong special to really want to run this. So it's a little bit more finicky in that way. But since I think they're going to keep the same kit that they keep giving it, where it's got like splat bomb and then support special, I think that that's a good formula that they have for giving people as their first weapon as they enter the game of Splatoon. Splattershot, I mean, it's my main. Obviously, you know, I enjoy this. Um, I, I am really nostalgic for the, the days of running around with a squirt gun in the summer that looked very much like that. Um, so I, I like the visual design, but that's not really, really what we're here to talk about. We're talking about its game mechanics. Um, the fact that this is a mid-weight weapon definitely takes it down a peg for me in that it feels less expressive that way. But they compensate for that with a lot more slaying power and so it's fair that it doesn't get to be quite as zippy and fast as the splash or the zap um it's never been a bad weapon and it, like the splash it's very versatile and that it can play as a support it can play as a slayer it can sort of skirmish a little bit it can even you know throw bombs from a distance and try to anchor as best it can. Um, the, it, it plays all of those roles at least halfway decently, as long as it's got a bomb. Um, and they do keep giving it bombs, which I think it really definitely wants. Um, so I'm a fan. Um, but also, I think like the combination of like shot RNG and slightly slower movement, it makes it feel a lot less expressive than I think some other shooters. Um, it kind of feels like there's just this like super optimal way to play it versus there being some like rock, paper, scissors you're constantly playing with someone because you're moving so fast and you're trying to make them guess where you're moving. Like here it's, if I didn't move to the right place the first time, I'm probably just going to go down. 
zap, um, a lot more zippy, and this one almost goes up a little bit higher for me, but again, I think it's the shot RNG that probably brings it down the most for me. Just shot RNG, it helps with painting a little bit, but with weapons that are going to try and fight, it always nerfs them pretty hard, and it's always going to feel just a little bit less satisfying when, like, you miss that crucial shot because your weapon missed and not because you missed. Um, that's part of what I like about a lot of the weapons on the top side. Like, if you miss with a splash, that's a skill issue. If you miss with a slosher, that's a skill issue. That was not a matter of your gun just deciding to spit a bullet sideways. Um, and a lot of those weapons up there are pretty darn accurate, if not perfectly accurate. And I think that's something that's really cool about them, that there's just more skill expression for that reason. Um, so that's the main reason I take it down a peg, but I like that it's a weapon that can play aggressive and is really, really close to just being like an optimal aggressive weapon with its speed, with its nearly as fast time to splat as like a splatter shot. Um, like it can go in and it can get stuff done and the way that it tends to play is you farm for special first, then you go and do that. That's kind of how it worked with its armor kit. That's how it works with the tacticooler kit. Um, and so it gives you a variety of play styles and it gives you a lot of strategic questions to answer. Like, when do I want to do things? The same can be said about all the short range shooters, I guess. I've kind of already gone over that. Splattershot Pro has really gotten a, a, not the most love in Splatoon 3 so far. But I actually like it a lot. Um, K-Pro was one of my favorite weapons from Splatoon 2. And I like that it feels a lot like playing a splatter shot, but you just get a little bit more range. And it gets you to think about the game in a different way. Where, like, you have very similar movement, very similar, like, role that you play. But it forces you to think in a different way about how you're going to play tactically because of the range. Um, so it's a fun way to... Get someone who's, say, used to a Splattershot Junior to figure out, oh, okay, so because I have range, now I want to do this instead. And, you know, a good branching off point into other weapon classes for learning players. Um, but it's the main reason that it's suffering right now isn't even necessarily the main weapon itself. It's the fact that there's such, such a better alternative in the squeezer that any top player is probably just going to pick the squeezer over it. Um, as a main weapon, not even considering the kits or anything like that. And I think if you take that away, if the, the squeezer isn't stepping on its toes like that, I think it has a much bigger role and a much bigger impact on the competitive scene. Dynamo is really fun, and like everybody who plays Dynamo is just so thoroughly devoted to it. It's a cult, all of the Dynamo players. They just love this big honk and hunk of metal. Um, it feels exactly the way that a big heavy weapon should. <laughs> it's a little bit cumbersome, a little bit weird and janky at times, but it hits really hard, it hits really far, and they've managed to get it into a place where it can shut down a frontline weapon, these zippy frontline weapons with like so much DPS by just bonking them. Um, and that is just wonderful game design. Uh, it's unfortunate that because of frame data in part and in part also because of kits that it hasn't seen quite as big of a role in the competitive scene. Um, I think finding some way to maybe make the paint or hitbox more consistent and make it so that it's just a little bit more reliable in that way. Like some little buff like that probably makes it a lot more realistic to run. Maybe map design is a part of it too. So I'm not putting it quite as high because it doesn't feel like something that everyone can just use at top level um, as long as it gets a good kit. Um, it feels like there's something, some small thing holding it back and that once they figure out how to design that out of it, um, I think it'll feel a lot better. But for now, I'm going to keep it here because it's felt like it's in about that place for some time now. Flingza, I think, is probably my favorite roller design in that um, it has a lot of the characteristics of the frontline rollers, and you get to play that play style, but you can also sit back and be a little bit more of an anchor, and being able to do both of those things makes it interesting tactically because you have to decide between one or the other. 
Um, and it allows you to, you know, do a lot of things, but also it has some clear weaknesses. Um, the, the, you know, relatively slow swing time, um, the fact that if you want to one shot, you've got to be a certain distance away from them. And if you get that distance, you're very committed. So you'd better not miss, um, but it paints decently well and it can use that, you know, if it's too far away, you know, if it's uh, not in a position where it wants to hard commit. So it doesn't feel like there are parts of the game where it's just completely boxed out and unusable. It always has a tool regardless of what range you're at. It's just, do you want the combination of all of those tools or do you want something more specialized? Um, what, what are you trying to run it for? Um, that's always an interesting question with this weapon. So I like that versatility to it, and uh, that's something that makes me put it a little bit higher. Um, Charger and E-Leader, kind of uh, two very similar classes here. Um, I think the basic Splat Charger is just great, like having a one-shot Charger, having it be pretty long range, giving you the ability on the, uh, the unscoped version to do this little hop before you fire is really cool, but scoping in is also really cool, and like watching someone who's good at that, it looks very fluid and smooth and fun. Um, honestly, you know what? I'm putting this a little bit higher, and that's screwing up the sizing of the list, but I like this one in particular because it's a short enough fire rate, a fast enough fire rate, that you feel like you get a bunch of chances and you also get the ability to move around to compensate for the, the extra range you're losing. I think E-Leader, it's cool in that it's just the longest ranged weapon and it's so dominant in that way, but playing it just feels very um, one note, I guess. Like you have like all of two places you can stand. It takes so long to charge up. So missing a shot doesn't feel great. Um, it's really, you know, powerful feeling, and I love the sound design on it, but I think I like the other charger for being a little bit more versatile, a little bit more mobile, um, challenging you to move just a little bit closer to the action to make sure you have an impact, um, and I think that that's a lot of fun, and also I miss a lot of shots, so getting another chance makes me happy. Try Slosher. Um, Try Slosher doesn't get to bend its bullets, and it it feels mean to say that it's like the kitty version of the Slosher, but like literally look at its design. It is for building sandcastles. Um, it's it also kind of feels that way mechanically in that instead of having to aim it or instead of having to do this really uh, mechanically intensive flick to get its curving or anything like that. You just slosh and the ink comes out in all three directions. Um, this is a weapon where it's really hard to untrain people from like walk and shoot syndrome on because they get used to just, oh, I can mash CR and then I win the fight. Um, and that kind of trains some bad habits in players early on that they have to unlearn going forward. Um, I don't think it's bad to have a weapon that's a little bit on the easier side like that, um, especially since at a competitive level, you know, if it's not able to get in, it has a lot of trouble. There is a lot of counterplay to it. It's not the longest ranged weapon in the game. Um, and if it doesn't get a pretty strong kit, then it might get shut down pretty easily. So um, it's a little easier, but that's not necessarily a bad thing for it. And I'm, I'm happy to have certain weapons, uh, especially, you know, It'd be nice to have a weapon like this in every class that's just like a little bit more beginner friendly, a little bit easier. Um, I think chargers, you know what? I'm taking chargers down a peg actually after all, because the thing about chargers is that early on they don't feel good. Um, it feels really hard to get into chargers more so than I think any other weapon in the game. I think people struggle more to get up to like S plus on a charger than anything else. Um, just from what I've heard about it. And I think the, like, the lack of a beginner-friendly version of that class makes it hard to recommend. So that's pretty nice. Um, heavy Splatling is... I feel like this is like the beginner Splatling. This is the, the tri-slosher of the Splatling class. This is... You 
have to be a little bit slower and a little bit more patient, but once you do, you are just lasering people. Um, and it's not such a long charge time that it feels frustrating to play with, but it's heavy and slow enough that it's okay to get, make it feel really powerful. And so as long as you're patient and you're willing to set yourself upright, you get rewarded for, you know, for that good positioning by being able to mow down two or three players in one go. Um, and I think that that's a great incentive to try and play the weapon. Um, I think it's good that it's relatively simple compared to some of the others. Like Ballpoint and Nautilus are very cool in the way that they can charge, recharge, and um, get different fire modes, uh, the movement of the Nautilus. But it's good to have a much more simple, stripped-down version of the weapon for people to learn first. And that's exactly what the Heavy Splatling is, and it does that really well. Jet Squelcher, um, what if shooter, but long? Um, it, I, I see no problem with this. It's got a pretty low kill time to compensate for the fact that, uh, low damage output, I should say, to compensate for the range. It paints really, really well, so it works as a support weapon, but in a similar way to how the Snipe Rider functions, it's something that um, can fight from a distance while it's trying to paint and kind of accomplish both of those roles at the same time. Um, but this one I think is well designed in, you know, current meta in that it doesn't do either of those things like super duper well. It just does them pretty well enough that the combination of the two is worth it. Whereas with something like the, the tactical or snipe writer right now, it's doing both of those roles maybe a little too well. Um, S-Blast, I was on the fence about, because what I don't like about S-Blast is that the long-range shots just don't feel like blaster shots anymore. They don't feel like the range blaster where um, you're trying to hit two shots of this thing with the indirect as someone's running away. You really just kind of have to hit them pretty directly with the shots. There's not a lot of room for error. Um, so it's a lot more aim-intensive but in a way that takes away your ability to hit them in certain places. Um, if you're trying to use AoE and hit someone over a ledge, you basically have to treat this like a Luna Blaster because the long range shots are just not going to do that for you. So I don't like feeling like it works like a blaster almost everywhere else, but in that one specific scenario where you're trying to hit someone at range and they get behind cover, you're just kind of out of luck and you don't get to be a blaster anymore. Um, so it's a weird kind of hybrid between the two that is fine being in the game, but that has never felt like as satisfying to me as playing the range blaster, even though there are extra capabilities that the S blast has that the range blaster doesn't. Rapid and rapid pro, um, occupy relatively similar niches, um, in that, they're a lot longer range, they're not lethal, so they have to be a lot more careful how they position, but they can still play pretty aggressively from that range because they have so much range and because they have the AoE. So there are a lot of times in the game where a Rapid Blaster has suddenly broken into the meta because there was a certain threat that needed to be addressed and it was just exactly the right weapon for the job and nothing else did exactly what this weapon did. It's like the longest ranged AoE. Um, except for, I guess, the Explosher kind of takes that, sort of. It feels a lot different there. Um, these are really cool answers to a lot of different problems in this game, and I think the fact that they've been in there have made a lot of metagames more interesting. Um, even back in Splatoon 2, where almost the only viable weapon was a Tri-Slosher, these weapons just randomly happened to be a good counter to that meta. And so you, it was usually like three Tri-Sloshers and one Rapid Blaster. And they, they keep popping up in weird little ways like that, where it's like, oh, hey, that's a neat and you know eccentric weapon, a quirky little guy to insert into the ecosystem that we have at that time. Uh, Tri-Stringer... Tri-Stringer, it feels like there's just something I can't put my finger on where it feels just like the tiniest bit, I don't know if underpowered, undertuned, like there's something about it that's just not quite making it to the upper, upper echelon of Splatoon weapons. 
it feels like it should be really satisfying, you know, chipping an opponent down or one-shotting them are both very satisfying things. Maybe it's the kits they've been given or something, but it's like, I'm so close to really wanting to love this as a backline weapon. Um, the, the decision to, you know, charge a certain amount to get a certain range, to get a certain shot spread, and thinking about where to place those, thinking about how to paint with it, all really, really interesting stuff. Um, it is getting a little bit on the complicated side, and like as a beginner, it feels like there's a lot that they have to learn to be able to grasp things like this, but that's also just a consequence of the game being older, and like you've explored all of the simple concepts by now, so we have to start introducing slightly more complex ones. And also, you've got to give something to the players who have been around this whole time, who are used to all the simple things, and are looking for a little bit more of a, a challenge to think about and how to play um, obviously at a competitive level, none of that stuff matters, but I think about it a lot for the beginner players because they're really the ones that you need to get hooked on the game. Um, and after that, you know, however long they stay is a bonus. The reflux is a lot different, which is a little weird. Um, it barely like feels like a stringer for how you play it. Um, it kind of feels just like a squiffer that paints really well, a we like a weaker squiffer that paints really well. Um, so I'd like more weapons in the Stringer class to explore like the exploding projectile concept and maybe have different versions of that in future installments. Obviously, you know, this was brand new to Splatoon 3, so they have some time to expand on this class and I'm interested to see what they do with it. But it just didn't feel very connected to the Tri-Stringer. Um, but that, not to say that, like, it's unenjoyable in its own right. Because, like, hitting those one-shots is sick. Having the ability to support in the meantime is sick. Like, it, it's a very versatile weapon and is, like, you know, one good kid away from being in the meta at any given point in time, I think. So, I think it's, it's interesting to have both of them. But... I'd like to see a little bit more of the stuff in between that gets you from one to the other. Wiper, I find a little bit less interesting than Stamper because I think Wiper just, it doesn't feel as satisfying to combo with this thing. It feels like you're kind of having to flail at someone for a long time before you take them out. Um, I, the, the fact that they introduced the new movement to it was massive for it and made it so, so much better in my estimation. Like the fact that they gave it this identity as a, an annoying thorn in your side, rush down, sit under a ledge and you can't remove it sort of weapon. Um, I think that's really fun. And so that's part of why it's up here. I don't know if that's what they really anticipated it being when they designed it. Um, and I don't know if the rest of the weapons elements kind of contribute to that super well. Um, the low damage just feels like, it feels like you're hitting someone with a, with a wet noodle a lot of the time, and that's the thing I probably like the least about it, and the problem that I put it a little bit lower than the stamper, um, that it just, it can feel frustrating to, like, hit so many shots, but still be so far away from being able to take them out. Um, and I understand that, like, not every weapon has to have a shooter's TTK, but... This one, I think it really emphasizes to me in the gameplay how it doesn't feel as empowering um, given, you know, the mobility that it otherwise has when it's not shooting. It does have a lot of mobility while shooting, but it's not the, the sort of kiting that you get from the dually sculptures that I think make them feel better in that particular play style. And so it has to compensate by just having a little bit of everything else, but doing all of that stuff worse than the other weapons. Like... If you're trying to make an ambush weapon, well, the roller splats so much faster. If you're trying to kite someone, the dually squelchers does that better with movement. Um, if you're trying to hit someone from long range, there are a whole bunch of different options that all do more DPS. So it's like it gives you a lot of things it can do, but all of those feel just a little bit meh. And so that's why I don't have it quite as high. Okay, this next tier, every weapon needs... It's very kit dependent. Um, if it doesn't have a particular kit, it feels pretty bad. It needs something to compensate for what are either obvious flaws in the weapon or um, ways that that weapon might be forced to play that are not fun. So 
the sploosh, it needs something either mobility focused or something that can get it to poke really well. Um, it it kind of needs that poking tool. I'm just going to say outright, like the only sploosh that I think to my knowledge has ever really been that strong was the one that had a splat bomb. Um, if you don't give it a poking tool, it's just not going to get on top of people very well. And it's going to feel in some cases like it's really weak and can't do an awful lot. But the fact that it's so zippy and zoomy is really fun. And I think that if you give it a poking tool, it can still feel that way while also just not being non-viable. Um, arrow spray is kind of similar in that it really needs something to compensate for the fact that its weapon is awful at fighting. It has a fast time to kill if you're close enough to, like, hug them. But until you get there, this weapon gets shredded like tissue paper. It doesn't have a lot that it can do to keep somebody off it. And uh, while, you know, it, it's it's got the high turfing output and everyone's like, yeah, but that's an advantage. It's like... If you're getting splatted often enough, it doesn't really matter how much you can paint because you're not securing space for your team. Um, so it needs something to really compensate for that. And I don't feel like any kid it's ever been given has compensated enough to f make it feel like it's a good weapon. But there have been times where it's felt like a fun weapon. I actually really liked the curling bomb rush version of this weapon. Um, it was a significant power spike for it, but it was also something it could use for movement. Um, it was really fast and disruptive. It let it move while using its special, which plays to its strengths of being fast paced. So like, I think there's definitely hope for it. Just, I, it's been a while since I've enjoyed using this when I could have been using another main weapon. It, it feels pretty like redundant to the game until it gets a better kit and then you're like oh wait being able to paint this insanely much and also move fast is actually a lot of fun h3 is sick but because it's so powerful with its three shot burst and its range that it gets those at it needs to compensate for that with a lot of massive weaknesses and those weaknesses are so significant that it needs the rest of the kit to compensate for them um it might be good to just buff this a little bit so that it's a little bit less kit dependent, but I think the better way to do it if, you know, Nintendo makes good design decisions is just give it a strong kit, keep the main weapon where it's at, and um, give it a game where it can be this kind of, like, wall that is hard to push against but is very aim-intensive and demands a lot of its user. I think this is kind of like a good version of the squeezer. The problem being the squeezer exists. Um, and by, by good, I don't mean like viable. Obviously, the squeezer is way higher on the tier list, but design wise. Carbon roller. So the really fun thing about the roller class is that you bonk people and they splat. And this is the roller where that might not happen when you try to bonk people. It's the one that doesn't do it when you bump into someone. So if you can't give them a kit that allows that bonk to deal lethal damage somehow, like with a burst bomb, for example, then it's really not that fun. Um, the, the close, close range one shot is fine, but that's the arrow spray problem. Like, sure, if you are, are close enough to smell the perfume they're wearing, then okay, that works, but when are you going to get there in a projectile-based shooter? Um, it's very rare that you're actually going to get that particular kind of damage. Um, it's much more common that, you know, you, you get, like, the burst bomb flick or something like that. So keep giving it a, a burst bomb, and it's going to be a fun weapon, uh, especially if you give it aggressive specials like the Zuka. Like, they really knocked it out of the park with the, tr the Carbon Deco kit. But... Oddly enough, it's always been the Carbon Deco kit and never the Carbon kit. Uh, the Varbin has been a meme for a long time. And if they're going to put a kit in the, in the game, I want it to be a kit that's fun. Um, and they've only succeeded with that like on a coin flip so far from what I, I've seen. I don't remember anything about it in uh, Splatoon 1. But out of Splatoon 2 and Splatoon 3, it's, it's again, it's been a coin flip. Which of these we really like? So... 
they, they, they need to do a good job with the kit design to make this fun. Splat Roller, uh, similar situation to H3, where it just has such massive weaknesses that it needs those to be propped up by its kit. And if they don't manage to do that with the kits that they give it, then it ends up not being fun. And given that Nintendo is not going to be giving up direction of kit design to anybody else anytime soon, it's kind of a toss-up whether it ends up with something that it actually likes. So that's where I stand on this. Um, Big Swig, again, it's the thing with the roller where it's like, I have to flick how many times to, to get someone with this? Like, it just doesn't feel as satisfying to swing this massive thing through the air and flick at someone and it's like, well, that did less than a 96 cal bullet. <laughs> like, it... The, the fact that it uh, paints so much is really cool, though. Um, the thing is, a weapon does not survive on paint alone. It needs to get something with that paint or have a way of fighting in addition to that paint. And this really needs its kit to prop it up in ways that I don't think we've really seen happen yet. So looking forward to seeing more kits on this thing and seeing what they do with it in future installments. But for the time being, it's felt a little bit like a pool noodle. Um, Squiffer is an insanely cool weapon. It's, you know, a charger that gives you the ability, the freedom to charge in the air. And so many of the Squiffers have just not been particularly viable. And it feels like part of it is the kits. Um, it feels like they just don't know what to put on this thing to make it feel cool, make it feel powerful. They definitely knocked it out of the park with the Zipcaster. Um, that's at least a very fun kit, and I'll take that over, you know, competitively viable, because that's just what's going to get more people into the game. Um, so hopefully they have a better understanding of what they need to put on this thing, but, like, having it get a really supportive kit that it can't really make use of, having it not shore up for the weaknesses of the weapon itself, it's always felt pretty unpleasant to try and play it's like there's a cool weapon here that's trying to be cool but needs a little bit of help to get there snipe rider i think i've come around on a little bit in that i think that the main weapon is kind of fun and satisfying to hit shots with if that's what you're doing with it the thing is right now it's got such a powerful support special that you can like aim and hit shots on people and also just paint half the map at the same time um so it needs a little bit of a, a different kit or a slight nerf or something. Like, ideally, we just, like, make the, the version that has Tactical or a little worse at painting or something like that, but let the weapon otherwise be what it is elsewhere. I don't know. Like, I think if you take this into Splatoon 4, you could totally just give it a different kit than it currently has, and it might just be fine. Um, without needing to be nerfed. But the fact that the version that currently has Tacticooler is so strong is a problem. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you could nerf it that I think could be healthy. Like, I, I, I don't like when someone's like, oh, how would you nerf it? I'm like, there are, like, so many different ways you could nerf its range, you could nerf its paint, you could nerf its points for special, you could give it a different kit that doesn't do the same things, like... There are a lot of different ways that we can change it from what it currently is to something that feels healthy and feels good. Because it's not a one-shot charger. It's a charger that, you know, if you go up against something like an E-Leader, you have to be really, really careful. And it can absolutely shut a pencil down if the E-Leader player is hitting shots on it. Um, like, there are weaknesses to this weapon. Just, it gets rewarded in its, you know, vanilla kit right now for playing so passively and it gets rewarded so much for doing that that it's not really like... It's like the bad versions of Jet Squelcher from S2, where they gave them too powerful of a special and made it too easy to, to farm for that special so that all of a sudden this thing just became a Raybot. Um, that's kind of what's happening to the Snipe Rider right here. It's just become a cooler bot. And I think they've figured out how not to do that with the Jet Squelcher. Like, the Jet Squelcher was pretty much the same problem. Very long range, not that much DPS, but enough that it counted in a fight. And still able to paint a lot so that it was able to be, like, a support and an anchor at the same time. Like, that's the same exact thing that's kind of happening with the Snipe Rider here. And I think that, you know, I've got the Jet Squelcher up 
higher right now because I think they put a kit on it that made it so that it wasn't going to be so dominant. You know, they didn't put Stingray, one of the best specials that's ever been in the franchise, on this support anchor weapon. You know, they put on some specials that take either a little bit more of an aggressive positioning to use well or that give you just a little bit less impact so that farming them isn't as big of a problem and you're focused more on the way that you use your main weapon than you would otherwise. Um, so I think they made the same mistake with the Sniper Rider, and I think that it's absolutely salvageable if they just changed the kits up. Um, but right now, like, it's hard to say what uh, whether, like, a particular kit would salvage it right now because we do currently have the other kit and people are going to choose that because it's strong. So I think this is a, we need to fix this in S4 issue. And for now we just nerf this in S3. Sloshing machine has made a pretty big impact on the competitive scene, but every time it made an impact on the competitive scene, it had a fizzy bomb. At least I don't know what what it was like in S1. I can't remember. But all of the other kits they've tried to put on it have not stuck from Splatoon 2 to Splatoon 3. Except for the one that had a fizzy bomb. Um, Neo Machine... I feel like Neo Machine is propped up by the strength of Zooka right now. I feel like if the Zooka were to be nerfed, that it would have a really hard time. And I don't feel like that's a special that's like super duper synergistic with it just that it's strong that's my take on it um i feel like the thing that made this work was the sub weapon it got and if it doesn't get that particular sub weapon it's a little bit mediocre uh, it's kind of hard to balance but the kit needs to be an important part of how it's balanced explo is really fun except because of its big weaknesses, again, needs a kit to compensate for it. And it often just doesn't get that kit. It just doesn't get something that's going to help its mobility. It doesn't get something that's, you know, going to allow it to really make a game-changing play with its special. Um, it puts all of that paint into something that's a, a little bit passive, a little bit supportive a lot of the time. Um, so you're really depending super heavily on the main weapon. So main weapon, super cool. Like if it was just up to the design of the main weapon, like whether I think that's cool or not, it would be much higher. But the problem is because of the weaknesses that are inherent in that design, it does need a particular kit to feel cool and powerful and expressive in the way that a lot of the other weapons do. Uh, Mini has had some really fun kits and none of them are in Splatoon 3. And there are going to be some people who get on me for that. I know Hitzel's not going to be happy to hear me say that. I know Rubber's not going to be happy to hear me say that. But I just don't think Hammer makes any sense on this weapon. And I think Bubble is not in a great place in this game. Where it feels like... I really enjoy playing specifically the Mini Splatling with either of those specials. Um, when it was just kind of spitting out paint to farm missiles... Honestly, that felt kind of cool because the weapon's not the best at combat, but the fact that you were able to kind of fight, kind of control space, but also paint for a powerful special, that was kind of neat. Now, missiles were oppressive in that game, but the mini itself felt cool to use while you were using the missiles. Um, it wasn't just a sit back in your base and farm the missiles kind of thing. It was, I'm farming while I'm also controlling space. What are you going to do about it? Um, and I think that aspect is kind of fun. So... It can definitely be cool. It just needs kit support. Glugas are another one of those weapons that just have a lot of weaknesses and need the kit to make up for the weaknesses. You know, fire rate and the, the paint is, is getting better, but again, the fire rate being so low means that it's never going to be fantastic. Um, and very, very aim dependent because of the fire rate. So it takes a lot of skill to be able to use them at all. And if they don't give it a good kit, then uh, no amount of skill is even going to save it. So um, I'm, they're on the cusp of being solid. And I think Nintendo is kind of narrowing down what kinds of kits they want to put on this thing. But 
for the time being, I haven't really played one that's felt like, oh, this is it. This is absolutely the qu quintessential Gluga's kit. This is the one that makes these weapons feel cool. Um, the wall is great, but I don't know. Maybe I don't like the main weapon, it, it just in general, to, maybe it's a little underpowered or something, but it's like, it feels like it should feel cool. And there's something about it that doesn't quite, and I want to say it's kit design. Brella, I'm not even sure if it's necessarily a particular kit that's holding it back. It feels sluggish. Um, it feels like it's something that you get locked into doing a, one particular action pretty easily on this thing. You've got to be super careful about your positioning to not just get too far forward. Um, it's really easy for this weapon to feel bad. And in the best hands, it's like, okay. And for anybody lower skilled than that, it just feels not that great. Um, someone typically kind of specializes, I think, in one of these weapons if they're going to pick them up. Um, you can't say that about every other weapon. Like, there are a bunch of classes that people, you know, will swap back and forth between. Brella, I just don't think is one of them, and I think it's because it's it's got too specific a skill set. Um, there's so much knowledge that you have to have on how to play any given encounter. You just kind of have to know every individual weapon matchup in a way that I don't think you quite need to know so well on a lot of other weapons. Like, on a shooter, you need to know, you know, how to treat a shorter-ranged weapon and how to treat a longer-ranged weapon, but knowing exactly how to play against that... I think you don't need to know as much until you get to higher and higher levels. Whereas with Brella, it feels like you need to know all of that stuff right away. Otherwise, you probably just run out of ink or get shot through your shield or get shot while you're, while you're trying to hit them. It's also, it's got a, a big accuracy problem where it's frustrating to not hit all of your shots even though you did hit them. It's frustrating not knowing how much damage you've done. Um, it, it, it makes the gun feel a lot less enjoyable a lot less satisfying when you don't even know whether you would splat them with a second one or not um the brushes ink brush is a lot of fun it's zippy it's a good sharking weapon and i like it for what it is octo brush I've warmed up to it a bit because it's kind of fun having the AoE and having a little bit more range to use that AoE with. Um, it, the zippy fun, hee hee, I'm over here, now I'm over here kind of play style. It falls off a lot on Octo, Octo Brush just because it's so much slower. Um, but I do like the extra range to it and I think that's a, a good addition to it. Um, but these are weapons that have massive weaknesses in the range department and also not great DPS. So you need to give them a, a map, first of all, where they can run around, which they don't really have that much right now. You need to give them kits that help them set up to uh, overcome those weaknesses. You need poking tools. You need specials that um, work with their play style that don't require them to be super immobile or something like that. So that locks them in a lot. So I put them down here. I'm glad they're in the game, but they're also kind of finicky in terms of whether you can actually make them powerful. Blah Blobber, I went back and forth a lot on because there are a lot of things I like about it and a lot of things that I think are dreadful about it. Um, I really like how it feels like an easier way to play the game up until around like early S plus um, because you kind of just put the blobs out there and it's almost out of your hands, whether they hit, it's like, am I putting them in the right general direction? Um, it, it feels a little bit less aim intensive, which can be nice for getting new players into the game um, for people who want to like try a long ranged weapon but can't quite understand the charge mechanic or are having trouble aiming on the chargers. Like, it's nice to have something that is long range that doesn't feel hard to play. Um, and I, I like that, you know, it paints a lot and you can, you know, feel like you're helping while you're painting, but that at a certain point, 
that paint isn't enough and you do have to start doing things with the main weapon. You know, hit, you have to start hitting your blobs and hitting your shots. Um, and you need to start getting something valuable out of the special and using that special skillfully. So I think there's definitely potential for it. It just hasn't felt great competitively and onward um, because of how slow the projectile speed is and how that really limits its ability to control space against competent players. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how they correct for that um it might just be they have to give it much more powerful kits than they have before um and maybe that helps because like the way that you can use the main weapon can be really cool but i don't think people are really incentivized to use it that way right now just because the kits don't prop the weapon up enough to make it fun for more than a few dedicated one tricks to want to try and use um this next tier is I like the ideas that this class has in them, but I think that we should be like redesigning the way that those characteristics are spread around the different weapons in the class. So like Dapple Dooley's dodge roll is super sick, the way that it's so fast and the way that it's so difficult to react to and the way that you're like shooting instantly and so it's really mechanically intensive. I think that's incredibly cool. And I feel like that's how I want the splat dualies to feel. But when they're on the dapple dualies, those dodge rolls don't do so much for you because you can only close so much space and the main weapon has absolutely abysmal range. So it's like my ideal version of these would be maybe like having splat dualies damage so it's not just going to shred something as crazy fast as the Dapples will. And having, like, the Splat Dooley's dodge roll distance, but maybe having the Dapples dodge roll speed. So that, that way, you know, it's not like it's completely unreactable to just roll at someone and immediately delete them, because you'd have the extra range. That'd be, like, a two buffed up Dapple Dooley's. But you actually have some range that you can use to poke at someone, and the dodge rolls, rather than just feeling like an overcommitment a lot of the time, um, that people, you know, people don't start fights by dodge rolling because you run out of the dodge rolls and then you're stuck. Um, it'd feel cooler if you could initiate a little more by dodge rolling. Just make those dodge rolls a little faster so they're harder to react to. But, you know, take away the super fast DPS so you're not creating an unfair situation. I feel like that would be a good melding of the two. And I would take a game that instead of having the two separate, where I feel like the Splat Dooleys are outcompeted by shooters and the Dapple Dooleys are outcompeted by, well, a lot of things. Um, you put the two together, and I think that that's a weapon that has a little bit more uniqueness to it, that the Splat Dooleys don't feel like Splash, but different in this game because they both have Crab and they're both competing for about the same slot. Um that they feel like more of a unique weapon class, more in the way that like a dually squelchers feels like a unique kind of dually. Um, I think that would be a cool change to make. Uh, Ballpoint and Hydra. I feel like the Ballpoint steps on the Hydra's toes too much, and in order to differentiate itself from the Ballpoint or the Heavy, the Hydra needs to over-spec into the areas of like damage and slowness to the point where it doesn't even feel that great to use at a, at a high level because you just kind of get out sped on your team comp a lot of the time uh, you have to make unorthodox plays that people don't expect i think on the hydra to get any value out of it because it's so slow um and because it, despite its slowness despite you know all of the downsides they've given it it's still outranged by the e-leader and doesn't splat as fast as the e-leader so it just completely loses the competition for being that long-range weapon needs to fight the the rest of the enemy team but the rest of the enemy team is a lot more mobile so it's in a bit of an awkward place and i kind of want to like give hydra uh, some of ballpoint's stuff like maybe make it because the ballpoint is always on the verge of being overpowered um it's a very very strong main weapon maybe like 
kick Hydra into a slightly like lighter weapon class or give it a slightly better charge time or something um, so that there's a reason to use the Hydra over the ballpoint more often. Um, or maybe just make it so that it's longer ranged or like lean, lean more into its strengths um, so that it's got a reason to be picked over the ballpoint more often and not just for like having a unique kit on the splatling. Um, it feels really similar to the heavy splatling, but the heavy splatling feels more versatile because it's got more movement. Um, it feels like the ballpoint being so mobile and not sacrificing that much in the way of range. Um, it just wants to get picked more often for that reason. So I, I, we've got to give the Hydra something so that it still maintains its role of feeling big and powerful and slow, but it's not just making you feel like you can't play the game that much. Uh, v Blaster and Clash Blaster and Luna, I kind of want, I feel like I want these to be collapsed into two weapons where one is the big AOE radius weapon and then one is the slightly longer ranged push forward blaster type. Um, and like, I, I think the fact that it's like the Clash and the Luna paint so poorly, you might combine those two and then just keep the V-Blaster where it's at. That's one option. Because um, they're both there for a really big blast radius. And they both suffer really badly from lack of paint. I don't know if you want to... The idea of the Clash Blaster being kind of a beginner-friendly weapon is something that makes me hesitate to talk about this. Because being able to just kind of walk forward and do damage in a massive area in front of you, you know, same way as the Tri-Slosher... It can be good for getting people into the game, although it is pretty frustrating early on to have to play against because you really kind of just do need to out-aim it and have a weapon that DPS is better to be able to beat it if that's what someone's trying to do to you. Um, newer players struggle with that, and I, I, I go back and forth between whether I think that that's a good early test of your ability to aim versus whether that's just... A frustration that might take someone out of the game or might make them rage at the game um luna it needs they've even given it like fizzy bomb and it still feels like it doesn't paint enough or have enough poke power from range like um i feel like the main weapon is just like a little too weak unless they put it in like splatoon one so i'm not sure how to adapt this but there, there's something i don't like about the short range blasters and there's some recombination i think of their traits that could probably get them get them all to a place that feels just as fun as like the range blaster itself okay now we get into my bottom tiers here um these are weapons that i'm like if these cease to exist in the game i'm not complaining that much um i think the 52 and the 96 are like, well, we already have those. This is your 96, and this is your 52. Like, they're so similar. We don't need that many shooters. And if we're going to remove shooters from the game, take the ones that have the annoying amount of aim RNG. Um, I get that, like, there's the trade-off between they're powerful, but they're more random and less reliable. But, like, more random and less reliable just means less skill expression. Um, and so you have to give the 52 gal this absolutely obscene time to kill to make up for the fact that a lot of its shots will randomly miss. And if you're trying to learn how to aim with this weapon, it's frustrating because like a lot of the time you're like, I feel like I should have hit that shot, but this game is so fast that it's hard to tell whether I actually should have hit that shot or if I'm just bad. Um, like it's, it's annoying to play in that... I often don't know gen genuinely whether it was a skill issue or whether the game was working against me there. Um, and the lower the fire rate gets also with those weapons, the worse they paint, the less mobile they are, the more frustrating it can be when you don't hit that crucial shot and now, well, I'm stuck, I can't get out of here. It's like, if you're going to make a high commitment weapon, cool, but make it so that like if you hit your shots, you succeed. 
You know, if you hit your blaster direct, if you hit your dualies dodge roll shots, then it feels good because you got yourself out of a dangerous spot. But if you lose that fight due to RNG, now that just doesn't feel great. Um, and I'd, I'd rather focus on the other shooters than have kits of these that I need to focus on that much. And I think that would go a long way toward curbing the, the idea of shooter bias that like, well, if you play shooters, you're going to have, you know, the kit you want because there's so many of them that it's bound to be on something, right? That cuts down on the number of them and makes it so that you have to make more decisions about what you want to play. And I think it would cut down on the bloat a bit. So yeah, I've, I'm fine with removing the gals. Like, I enjoy playing 52. Like, give the splatter shot a wall or, like, the, the pro a wall, and I will enjoy playing it the same way that I enjoy playing the 52 gal because playing around a wall with a shooter is fun. Like, I've enjoyed kits of these, but I think as a main weapon by itself, you don't need this particular main weapon to get all of the fun that you could have out of those kits on another shooter instead. I think that would diversify the shooter class a lot too, because instead of having so many support shooters, you could have like one that's support, the support shooter, one that's the, you know, wall shooter, one that's the, you know, slightly longer range version that has some, you know, poking tools or some unique special, like th there's a lot that you can do still with the shooter class without having those two weapons in it. Um, and so that's kind of the the reasoning there. I, I, I'm fine having them in the game. I don't think it's like harming the game to have them, but I could also enjoy a game that ha doesn't have them just as well. L3 Nozzle Nose is like, it feels to me like the most unsatisfying weapon in the game because even if you hit this sick three-shot burst, you keep your aim on perfectly throughout the whole thing, you still haven't splatted them. You haven't gotten anything out of that. You don't even get the cool sound effect that the H3 has. You've done something insanely skillful that benefited you very little, and you're going to have to fire the second burst anyway. So it's like, what was even cool about hitting all three shots of that? You could have hit two shots of it and then just hit two shots of your next burst, and you're fine. Um, it's, it's really awkward, and I don't like that about it. Um, the range that it has is not that much better than what you're getting out of a lot of these shooters. And that makes it difficult to come up with a kit for this that actually is worth running. Um, it needs a lot out of its kit, so much so that, like, I don't know what kind of kit would really save it in a lot of cases. It'd have to be something kind of broken and supportive, um, which isn't really a fun way to have to play the game in order to enjoy playing this weapon. Um, I think like H3 is a good burst fire weapon as a main weapon. Just give more kits to the H3, I feel like. I, I don't... I'm not missing an awful lot from specifically the L3, and I feel like it's a pretty unpopular weapon in general. So maybe somebody else has different feelings about it, but that's where I'm at. Heavy edit feels really uninteresting to me in that it's just like heavy charge time but with nautilus range it's like a mini splatling but feels more like a heavy splatling for the firepower that it has um it's like i feel like you you just give a good kit to the mini or give a you know a different kit to the nautilus and you've got a lot of what the heavy edit has to offer um i don't feel like it's gimmick really needed to be there i don't feel like it, it if it's another way to get splatling kits in the game, fine. But I would be happy in a game that doesn't have this and just has good kits for the other splatlings. Um, Rebrella, it f doesn't feel very Brella-like just because of how weak the shield is. Like, the, the shield gives you so little utility on launch and whatnot that, like, it feels frustrating to try and use like a Brella and then to just be like, well, there goes the Brella bit, and if I move forward with it, I'm going to be splatted. So now I just have a weaker gun. Um, I'd much rather have the sturdier shield of the splat Brella. And I, I don't... If you're going to get something out of launching the shield, then, like, 
make the shield a little bit stronger and just give it a normal Brella gun or something. Like if you're trying to make this like a fast version of the tent, then it's going to need more to be able to activate that play style, I think. These next weapons, some of them I think are like actively detrimental to the game. Some of them I think have been weak for so long that I'd rather just the dev time go toward other weapons. Um, the various reasons that I'm like, I would almost rather this just not be in the game at all. Um, if you're going to put it back in the game, significantly rework it. The Nova is really frustrating because most of the time when you have like a, a lot of like paid output, it at least has a pretty good time to kill, at least up close. You have something to play toward for aggressive play. Most of the time, if you have some kind of range, you have some kind of kill time there. Um, but it's just got this bizarrely bad shot spread, this bizarrely bad time to kill. And the only way to prop it up is to make it into a paint support, but there are already plenty of paint support shooters. And if this one gets a broken special and I'm forced to play it, I don't want to play this weapon. This weapon doesn't feel like it's a representation of my skill. <laughs> it's a weapon that... I'm going to be weaker on in any given fight that I'm put into. And I'm if I were to play it, it would be because I'm forced to put up with it for the special that it gets. Um, it's just too weak in a fight, in a game where fighting matters too much. And they might prop it up with good kits, but I'd rather they just give solid kits to the weapons we already have. Like, I'd rather all of the kits that's on that are on this just be given to like a splatter shot pro or something um and be able to play that weapon instead where it feels like the place that i'm aiming actually is having damage done to it um where it feels like my aim matters <laughs> um so yeah not a huge fan of this one squeezer is a big problem for accessibility in the game um this is a a weapon that actively harms people's hands because trying to use it um, causes them physical injury from having to tap so frequently, from having to repeatedly press the button so much. Um, it's this, and then on like a tier lower, you've got the brushes. Um, but those those are the weapon classes that uh, caused the most injury in the game. Like we did a, a study, a brief, like obviously not the most scientific of studies, but um, we got data from a good like hundred something people. Um, and... Squeezer and brushes were the ones that caused the most injuries, squeezer being the most. Um, and part of it is just the fact that they made it so that you have to tap shot to get the maximum damage out of it. I see what they're trying to do. Like, it makes sense why they would do this, but for something that they haven't considered. Um, what they're trying to do with the squeezer is make it so that the faster you can mash the more fire rate you get. And so they're trying to add this like mechanical component where if you can handle mashing really fast, then you get rewarded for that skill. The problem is that's not a skill that we should be rewarding in this game, which is something that, you know, you'd think they'd have learned with, you know, some of the Mario Party mini games where people got like internal bleeding in their hands from trying to spin the stick too much. Um, you'd think that like, they would realize, hey, mashing on a controller isn't something that you want people to do so much um, that, like, they're going to play this this weapon for as long as a lot of people play these weapons to get good at them. Um, it's just something that's going to cause, like, a lot of rep repetitive strain injuries. It's going to cause people to have to learn how to stretch their hands, and there's nothing in the game telling you, hey, make sure to stretch your hands sometimes or anything like that. It's just... Ugh. Um, not to mention, you know, the impact that this has on people who can otherwise play the game normally, but a disability interferes with this particular thing, or an injury interferes with this particular thing. Um, and the problem is also that they made it so dang strong that, like, when someone does get good at that, they beat so many of these other weapons, just main weapon to main weapon, that unless you give it a cursed kit it's going to be strong enough that why would you consider even a pretty decent kit of the Splattershot Pro? Like, the Forge is not a bad weapon. I think the Forge would see a lot more use if the Squeezer just didn't exist. Um, and so 
if you're gonna do something with this design and try to revamp it, it's got to be a pretty substantial revamp to make sure that you're not hurting people, to make sure that you're not b bullying out a lot of the other weapons in the game. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this, and it's long overdue, I think. GooTuber is a weapon that has literally never been meta. Um, it was used, like, one time by, like, a couple different people at Big House to try it out, and they immediately ditched it after that for Flingza. Um, it's a weapon that has a gimmick that is just worse than all the other chargers and has been worse than all the other chargers gimmicks since the GooTuber was introduced. Um, it's just never been good. It's always been a meme. It's got shorter range than it should really have for how slow of a charge time it's got. And yeah, you can swim the charge forward towards someone, but like a Nautilus can swim the charge forward towards someone. And if it misses its first few shots, it gets to kind of keep going. And it makes up for the fact that, you know, moving and then trying to hit a shot afterward is kind of difficult. But with this weapon, if you miss that shot, well, you're not getting another charge before you get splatted. So you absolutely have to hit that shot. And even if you do hit that shot, if there's another player around, you're still in trouble. Whereas, again, the Nautilus can just turn from one target to another. So th there's just a fundamental design flaw with this, and it needs to be reworked substantially to ever be useful. Um, and the problem is that it's not even that fun of a weapon if you're, like, a new player or something like that, right? I can talk about how, like, the Clash Blaster isn't a particularly strong main weapon. There, it definitely has some strengths, but it has a big paint weakness that needs to be addressed before it's really going to be super viable in any case. Um, but, like, the GooTuber, it's not really, like, super strong or fun at any level. You can't just, like, walk forward and hit indirects with it. But you also try to take this into high level, and they're going to be playing something better. So, like, when, do you, when is the use case that you want a GooTuber? Um, what kit can you give it? that is going to salvage the main weapon. Um, just redesign the main weapon, I say. Similar problem with the Undercover Brella. Um, the Undercover Brella is a little bit more fun at like a lower level when um, people's aim isn't as good, but the thing is your aim on the Undercover also needs to be good because it has one of the slowest kill times in the game and you need every pellet of those shots to count. So I think people figure out pretty early on a lot of the time that the Undercover is holding them back a little bit um that it's kind of one note just like walk forward at them and hold zr and hope you hit your shots um i don't find that to be particularly interesting tactically i think that's a really big oversimplification of the game and one that if this were to be strong enough would be really bad for the playability of the game at a competitive level like this weapon has to be weak because if the idea is just thoughtlessly walk forward onto the battlefield, holding down the ZR button and getting splats for that, if that's a thing that works, then this game is tic-tac-toe instead of chess. Um, so it's got to be weak, just inherently, in order for this design to be okay. But that means it's going to be weak. And it's hard to think of like how they're going to give it a niche that doesn't feel either really, really weak or really, really oversimplified. So I'd be fine just never seeing the undercover, but I know a lot of people would disagree with me on that. And it can be, to be fair, a vehicle for some fun kits that have existed in the game. Um, I think the the simpler firing mode where you don't have to worry about how to flare the Brella, um, I think does lend itself toward some interesting supportive gameplay at the very least. So I'm not opposed to it coming back, but I do want it reworked if it does come back. Um, pain brush. I don't get what people see in the pain brush unless they're just using it as a support weapon. And there are so many other weapons that do supporting fine. Um, it's really slow. It's like people compare it to the dynamo a lot, but it's like you have to hit two swings. At least the dynamo has the fun of being like, well, if I get my swing, then you're getting bonked, bonk. But this is, it's not really a bonk. It's more of like a, ha, 50 HP. What are you going to do now? And here comes the second swing. Wait for it. Wait for it. Ha, you're down now. Like, 
it, it makes the weapon itself feel weak mechanically <laughs> that like this big wind up of a swing is doing again i think less than a 96 gal bullet i'm gonna confirm that really quickly but i think that's true yeah so this the the 96 gal does 62 damage and the pain brush does at most 60 damage so like spending that long getting that little out of it doesn't feel great and they make it paint a lot to compensate and they give it a lot of aoe but it's still not that great of a range to have that kind of aoe like they can't make it fast either which is like the defining characteristic of the brush that it's able to move fast that it's able to put the brush down and roll with it so at the speed that it's moving it's like it feels kind of like a roller which almost never rolls in competitive play because that's relatively slow doesn't paint as much so it's like it's very immobile but it's also very slow to splat someone so what are you getting out of this except for like some aoe in very specific situations and a lot of paint um i don't f feel a reason that i as a player would enjoy playing this over other stuff like i don't see the appeal of it i don't see how it makes you feel powerful or skilled or tactical um it feels like the weapon is just like holding you back at every turn um not that it's like the weakest weapon in the game but it is definitely i think uh th there are a lot of aspects of it that are liabilities to any kit that it's on and a lot of the kits that it has i'd rather just kind of go to other weapons that i would enjoy playing more so those are my takes there um feel free to go get angry about them in the comments now Thank <laughs> you.